Check out our extended version of Bob Rennie's talk with Sarah Thornton. Bob, it is great to see you. Uh, the last uh, trip I made was to see one of your marvelous shows at the Rennie Museum in Vancouver. Bob's collection consists of uh, about 2,600 works, um, many of them very important pieces, especially when it comes to issues of social justice, very important African-American artists and women artists. And the show that I saw there uh, consisted of Lorna Simpson and Barclay Hendricks. And there were many amazing works, but I think everyone should make a pilgrimage to see Barclay Hendricks's brilliantly endowed, uh, an amazing painting, a true masterpiece. And I wonder, one of the things that uh, you've told me in the past is that uh, you own trophies, but you don't buy trophies. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think that, I think, yeah, first of all, thanks for having me on. But uh, it's, it's how this sort of started is, you know, Barclay Hendricks' Brilliantly Endowed or Kerry James Marshall's Invisible Man from 86. Uh, it, it's an awful word, but they are trophies, but we, do, we don't acquire trophies. Um, and, and the Barclay Hendricks' Lorna Simpson show, two of, the, two of artists that we do span their careers and collect in depth, was very important to us because before Barclay passed, we asked if he was okay showing with Lorna Simpson, and he thought it was a crazy question for me to ask, but you never know personal relationships. Forget about artistic uh, respect of each other. And Brilliantly Endowed is a painting that I think I begged Barclay to sell to me whenever I would be in his presence through Jack Shaman's or a, a dinner where you'd bump in for five or six years. And Barclay always said to me that that painting has to go to a museum and I walked up to him and it was actually the Tate dinner and I said to Barclay you have to you have to let it come to my collection because he knows what we had done with all of his self-portraits and I I said I'm a fake museum Barclay I said I will hang it in my dining room and he said if you'll hang it in your dining room I will sell that painting to you and through Jack Shaman we, we, we acquired the work and um, it, it, you know we have Barclay's reversed American flag black on one side that was done in 67 which is probably the most advocacy he's put into a painting and we have a photo bloke the pink painting which was from his last show so we try and bookend our artists careers and our job is not our voice, yet here I am using my voice, but to elevate the artist's voice. I know there were other important people trying to buy that work, because I could swear Rashid Johnson told me that he had tried to buy Brilliantly Endowed off of Barclay Hendricks several times, and he did his own homage to that work where he appears naked in a photograph. But tell me, um, you're ahead of the curve and people often sell to you because of your profound commitment to particular artists' work. How often do you buy at auction? Uh, you know, if, if, if we, we talk about this, if, you know, when you're, when you're trying to fill in gaps in an artist's career, um, sometimes they only come up at auction and actually tomorrow uh, you know, we as we have Kerry James Marshall's uh, Invisible Man, and tomorrow the 50 inch by 31 inch drawing from 1986 of the Invisible Man for the first time ever has come out of a collection to auction. And we were wrestling because that is buying a trophy, and can we possibly afford to do it? But we don't have to make the decision because it was pulled from Sotheby's auction, so it saved us. Uh, racking our brains of how to put it together. But to answer your question, uh, maybe 5% of the collection comes from auction. Uh, yet if, you, if you go back to talking about Brilliantly Endowed and Rashid Johnson, we looked at taking on Rashid Johnson's photograph of himself naked, um, and he is Brilliantly Endowed, and but we thought, no, Barclay doesn't need to be seen in appropriation. We thought Brilliantly Endowed should uh, be shown with uh, 
Kerry James Marshall's Invisible Man, and possibly Lyle Ashton Harris's construct from 1989, where as an 18-year-old he, fo he photographed himself naked and the challenges not only from the ph photographic community, from the artistic community, from, from the black community, but here a lot of black artists and voices are wanting to be seen and an 18-year-old comes along and photographs himself naked. And we think that those three talk to each other very well uh, because it's our collection, I don't have a board, I want to put it with uh, Piss Christ of Andre Serrano's also. We have the piece where it was smashed in a church in the 1990s and I think that that is um, a social commentary as much as dealing with art. Um, Black Lives Matter has arguably had a positive impact on the overall value of your collection. And I'm wondering if you have any predictions for how the election might impact the art market. Uh, tying those all together, we have a huge responsibility now. We always felt we had a responsibility. Um, you know, if we had put together the collection uh, recently, as a privileged white male, I, 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 I don't know how we would deal with it, but you know, we, we bought Carrie James Marshall's uh, Invisible Man in the 90s at a furniture auction in Los Angeles. And I have received a phone call when I paid $54,000 for it that we paid way too much and people are laughing at me. So from a, a value point of view, uh, these voices have to be elevated. And it was Kerry James Marshall who said to me, Bob, if you go to a museum and you don't see a black figure on the wall, then you think it doesn't belong. And that resonated with me over 20 years ago. And that thread carries through. And the fight has become to the surface, but it has not changed. And you know, we have 92 works out on loan to museums. I'm very autistic about numbers. And so we're aware of how we're participating out there, but we're going to be very, very careful to listen to what the artists want and what museums need. And I think within 10 years, we'll probably close our museum. And I have a fantasy of becoming the greatest lender in the world. And that's helping with shipping and helping artists get their works into museums where it's going to be much more difficult for museums to acquire for one thing, but to finance even putting on a show if what we're seeing today is any indication of what's to come. That uh, sounds amazing. I have met few collectors with um, such a certain eye. I'm always impressed by the, the speed and accuracy with which you know what you want and what makes for a larger, a larger conversation within your collection. And, um, you know, there's this cliche in the art world that some collectors buy with their ears and others buy with their eyes. And I was just wondering what that expression meant to you. Well, I used to collect with my ear and I collected only Canadian art from or primary, a lot of Canadian art from when I was 17 years old. My, I, I was married and Mieko was an artist and that got the needle in the arm about uh, art and collecting. And then I decided in the late 80s, early 90s, that it wasn't the right thing for me to do, that I wanted to start buying with my eye and my heart. And that's what we did. Uh, but I actually mentioned to Josh before we came on to this interview that, that nothing comes into the collection that doesn't speak to the collection. So once the collection got going, um, if we just followed our heart, and if you're talking to Carrie James Marshall's work, or you're talking to Doris Salcedo's, or you're talking to Mona Hatoum's, it is easy to stay on the same path. And, you know, once artists get to that this certain level where some of them are at, we, we can't continue to bring them into the collection, but we can continue to support them 
with what I call our supporting documents that are in the collection. Collecting with a mission rather than being guided by commission, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, 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 I had lunch with a young, art, a young collector in Vancouver yesterday and I just said, pick a lane and get in it. Collect only black and white photographs, collect only trees, collect only faces that are sad, but take yourself out of a lot of lanes so you don't need to get into those conversations. There's a lot of wonderful artists out there, but I don't research them and get into that lane because I, I, I can't afford to bring them in the collection nor do they speak to my collection. And I think you start out with a lane and you can always turn right or turn left but you start somewhere. Last question, you uh, have a f are you full of bon mots and one of the contrasts that I really like um, is in your words the difference between social jewelry and social justice. And do you have any guidance for other collectors on that score? Um, I'll, I'll tell it through a parallel. Is in 2010, I ran out and bought a Prius. And my daughter, I have three children, my daughter reprimanded me that, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going green. And she said, you're a fraud. You are buying green jewelry. And I have now transferred that to, um, I get a lot of calls, people saying, what black artist are you looking at? And I'm going, are you serious? Um, I could pick a few I don't like and send them to them, but I'm not that cruel. But, but we are all computers. And when you put new information into a computer, you reinforce the previous decision or you alter your decision. And as a collector, as anybody watching this as a collector, you are your own computer and you've put a data bank together that you make your own decisions as you move along. And yet I just see a lot of people diving into the social injustice and social commentary side that haven't participated before. And it's easy to criticize that they shouldn't be doing it, but they're supporting artists and maybe some of they might get in for the wrong reason, but some of them will stay in for the right reasons. So I'm really tempering at how I look at that now is let's support artists. You might get in for the wrong reason because it's good Starbucks or dinner conversation, but you might stay for the right reasons and support artists and support museums moving forward. So that's sort of, I'm old. <laughs> it's just sort of the way I'm looking at things. Bob, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And um, our fingers are crossed for the impact of art about social justice on the real world of social justice. Yeah, but, the, but our consciousness has been raised with what you see going on in your American politics. And so I'm answering your question. Uh, we're going to, we're not going back to where we were, we're going to stay conscious. Sounds good to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah Thornton, and thank you, Josh Bear, for putting these things together. This is unusual for me, but I enjoy it. Thank you, Bob thank Rennie. You.